This program is brought to you by Emory University. Good evening. My name is Robert Franklin. I'm president of Morehouse College, and I welcome you to the Ray Charles Performing Arts Center on our campus. It seems appropriate for a facility named in honor of Ray Charles to be permeated with music. You should know tonight that my glee club, the marching band, and the drum line are all rehearsing right around this building. It's also my pleasure to welcome you to the Atlanta University Center. And right across the street, our partner institutions, Clark Atlanta University and the Morehouse School of Medicine sit, and closest to us, Spelman College. Their president, Beverly Daniel Tatum, is here tonight. And Beverly, I'd like to acknowledge you. We're delighted that Morehouse College is serving as a host uh, t for this evening's program. It's been my pleasure to serve on the advisory committee for these very exciting CNN dialogues, and I'd like to thank all of my distinguished co-advisors. But particularly important, I think, for this topic, living on the edge with social media, to meet on a college campus where students are 
not simply voracious consumers of media, technology, and products, but also creators and producers on Facebook, Twitter, and the like. And while I acknowledge the advantages of social media, we all have seen when things go sideways and when people are harmed. And so I look forward to tonight's conversation. I know it will be like last time we met at Carter Center, a sparkling and provocative conversation that will all be buzzing as we leave here this evening. And so I thank you for being here and urge you to come back often whenever you hear of events occurring on this campus. It's now my pleasure to introduce to you Ms. Janita Du. She is the Assistant General Counsel and Chief Diversity Advisor for CNN Worldwide. Please welcome Janita. Thank you. Thank you so much, President Franklin. On behalf of CNN and our partners, Emory University's James Weldon Johnson Institute for the Study of Race and Difference and the National Center for Civil and Human Rights, I want to welcome you and say how thrilled we are to bring CNN Dialogues to Morehouse. So thank you. I also want to take a moment to recognize Dr. Rudolph Byrd, the head of the James Weldon Johnson Institute, who could not be with us this evening due to a personal health challenge he is facing. Dr. Byrd has been the inspiration and the brainchild behind CNN Dialogues, and I know he would love to see the engaging discussion that we're going to have in a moment. So please, let's all of us send our positive energy to Dr. Byrd and make him proud. And I can think of no better person to lead the charge than our own CNN anchor, Don Lemon. Don? <laughs> Thank you, Janita. Am I on? Can you hear me? Good evening. How you guys doing? Thank you so much for coming. And this is a point where we usually say we want you to turn off your cell phones and your PDAs. We don't want you to do that. We want you to leave them on, and, but just turn the ringers off, right? And we want you to tweet about this and Facebook. It took me a, a beat because I was actually on Facebook back there, and they said, go, she's introducing you. <laughs> and so we're going to find out tonight a lot of things. We're going to talk about a lot of things. Number one among them, I want to know why Pete Wentz is afraid of Jack in the Box. He won't tell me. So if you can tweet that or Facebook that to get an answer from me by the end of the evening, I'd really appreciate it. So listen, we want to say, we, um, again, as I said, thank you for coming. Start positive. It's great that you're here. Randy Zuckerberg had a family emergency, and so she can't make it. So our thoughts are with her but we're sorry she's not going to be able to make it tonight. But we're going to learn a lot of things. We're going to talk about some inter interesting things. We hope that you are enlightened. We hope that you enlighten us. And uh, we're CNN. We are the world. And we appreciate you coming here. And we appreciate your advice. And uh, we appreciate learning from you. So without further ado, our panel. Come on, guys. Walk out. There we go. First up, Sean King is here. You probably don't recognize that guy. Pete Wentz is here. Baratunde Thurston is here. And Maggie Jackson here this evening. I'm going to tell you about all these guys. I have all of my devices. How many devices? Where are your devices? My device is my mind. Oh. <laughs> well, let me see, let me see you get on the, on the internet with your mind. I'm working on it, really man. I'm working on it. Tonight. Tonight. Direct Jack in. I'll be really impressed tonight. First up, uh, I'm going to introduce, I'll start with Maggie here. Maggie is an award-winning author, and she's a journalist known for her in-depth coverage, I'll do my anchorman voice, of U.S. social issues, issues. Her most recent book is Distracted, right? Yeah. Where were One you? One reason Where we're were here. You? Where were you? What were you doing? The Erosion of Attention and the, and the Coming Dark Age. So I want to read that. I haven't, I'm going to be honest, I haven't read it yet, but I'm going to get it. All right. And I'll report back to you. Get you a copy. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Baratunde, so a big round of applause for Maggie. She also said, don't, don't uh, let the only girl on stage get shut out, and you, you won't. You'll be fine. <laughs> I think she can handle it, because she was handling me back there going, hey, you, quiet. Okay, Baratunde Thurston, you may recognize him. Uh, you've been on CNN. You've yeah. been, we see your face. Uh, but he is a, a comedian. 
and blogger. He co-founded the political blog called Jack and Jill Politics, and we go to you for, especially during election coverage, we're going to talk to him about a little bit about that. He also serves as the director of the digital, of digital for The Onion. You guys know what The Onion is? Yeah. It's not real. <laughs> we are. It's not real. <laughs> Sometimes. Uh, oh, 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 all right. Oh, let's do All it. right. <laughs> Somebody's not going to get any questions tonight. <laughs> Pete Wentz is here. Pete Wentz, who grew up in Chicago, my former hometown, one of my hometowns I've had many, uh, a suburb of Chicago. A musician known for his roles as the bassist and lyricist of the Grammy-nominated band Fall Out Boy. Yeah, you can woo. When you woo, woo, woo. That's not you, though. It's That's not. another person. Wow. Unfortunately. Who is that? Who's the woo song? Is that? Um, Jeffrey Osborne, I should know that. <laughs> Jeffrey Osborne. <laughs> uh, that's the OJ. No, that's the OJs. That's um, the Ohio former. What was Jeffrey with before? Tia. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. See, I need a computer. I'm online. That's my thing. Um, Fall Out Boys, and he's one of the first ever artists to blog in the music industry. He, you started early on. You started on social media early on. Um, and you have since garnered one of the largest social media footprints ever in 2010. So we're glad you're here to talk about that. Because it, it's really, social networks have made a big difference when it comes to music, because the music industry is changing. We're going to talk about that this evening. And then we have Mr. Sean King. Sean King is a pastor and the founder of the Courageous Church. It's called Courageous Church in Atlanta. Have you guys heard of it? If you haven't, then you should know about it. Because it's a church that's centered around sort of social media, but it's techie, right? A techie humanitarian church. Uh, so. He calls himself a social entrepreneur and a pastor, am I correct? Sure. Okay. Uh, and he founded Twit Change, uh, one of today's leading voices on how social media works and social media in general. So a big round of applause for everyone. <laughs> All right. You guys awake? You ready? You ready? Yes. All right. Well, this isn't going to be boring. And you can, you can, I know, you, he's backstage, he's going to be trouble already. All right, so let, you saw the video, and you, you saw how much social media is really just entrenched in our lives, in most people's lives. My mom, who turned 69 last week, is on Facebook. She's, she's not on Twitter yet, but she wants to learn how to do it. But the, the, I, I friended her last week. That was the hardest thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> Did you restrict her access to your profile? No, but she started responding to some of my friends, and I'm like, Mom, you can't respond, especially political things. Do not get me in trouble. <laughs> and she goes, okay, baby, I won't get you in trouble. All right, so social net, I'm going to give you a few statistics, and some of them you saw in, in the videotape that they showed. Social networks and blogs continue to dominate America's time online, now accounting for nearly a quarter of the total time spent on the Internet. One quarter of the total time spent on the internet. That means at work, we are not being that productive, I'm sure, as productive as we should be. And social media has grown rapidly, another statistic. Today, nearly four in five active internet users visit social networks and blogs. So my first question, how has social media changed our lifestyles? How has it impacted the way we think? I'm gonna ask you. Well, I, mean, I think it's made our world a whole lot smaller. I mean, even uh, for me, I remember uh, when the earthquake first hit in Haiti, I was friends on Twitter with several young Haitian guys in Haiti, and before I saw it on CNN, they were tweeting about it. And I mean, it changed my life because it was the first natural disaster that I was seeing unfold in real time, and I took it personally. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, it used to be that, I, I mean, I would be so many steps removed from something like that happening, but social media immediately allows us to connect with people that used to feel worlds away. And I mean, right after that disaster happened, I was tweeting back and forth and giving GPS directions to people on how they could help people on the ground. And so, be it, I mean, even I've interacted with most of this panel online, and even though we haven't spent a lot of time face to face, you're able to build relationships and uh, just makes the whole world smaller. And, and it's free, and so yeah. it's, it's, it's not cost prohibitive. So, Barrett, I want to ask you this because yeah. he brings up a good point, and then Steve Jobs, you know, sadly just passed. Yeah. And it has been said that Steve Jobs actually changed the way our minds work with the swiping and everything, and we, the, the way we can multitask yeah. now. Do you think social media has, in the question, has changed the way people 
think worldwide, especially in, in Yeah, I think America? there's a couple of ways I'm thinking about answering that. The first is that we think less because we outsource so much of our brains to the world. Right, you don't know anything. You didn't know the name of that song. Well, you I, threw I, it out no, to the but, crowd. No, right? but listen. So. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. I think you're. I, no, you so make a, a part. It's of a very it. good yeah. point. It's I'm, like I can't remember a phone number yeah. now. I can't remember. Um, I just go, oh, yeah, you Google it really quickly. Yeah, so you don't even, have to use even that Even more anymore. than Google, like what, what we often do is we throw questions out because we're too lazy to Google, right? right? Like you could easily ask Google. He's like, I'm going to ask my friends, and my friends are going to ask Google because no one knows anything anymore. Right. But I, I do think there is a, to be a little more serious about it, I'm, I'm partially serious on that, the way our minds work and the way our connections work, we're in some ways returning to the source. Mm. We've always had conversations, society, family, and in our leaping toward what we consider to be progress, which is often isolation, which is often overwork, undersleep, eating poorly, like we're, we're alone. Yeah. We don't bowl together anymore. We work all the time, we're in school all the time. Kids have planners and applications to schedule their time. And what social media has helped to do is reconfigure and reassemble that water cooler that we lost when we started working yeah. so much and being away from our families. Well, I, I, think it does I see people sitting around, yeah, go, go ahead, yeah, my next that. question was you. I think that social media Changed, you know, so much of what we do. But you know, there's relations, and then what we think that what we think, you know, are they're somewhat similar and they're somewhat different. But you know, I think social media gets people to the doorstep. We can't overlook the fact that you know, if you tweet and if you you know do Facebook, it's getting you to the doorstep of a gazillion connections. It's you know, weak ties, which are um, you know, fantastic. You know, weak ties are the strength, and that's been researched in the 70s. On the other hand, weak ties only get you so far. I mean, the research also shows that when you're looking for a job, a weak tie will not actually get you anything but information. It's only, uh, there's a limit to what the weak ties will do. It's, only, it's usually the friends of a friend, a very limited mm -hmm. social circle that actually gets you the job. Right. So I think we have to make sure that we look at the balanced picture mm -hmm. And um, you know, and not forget about the strong ties. Not the I'm your people a, walk up to me and go, I'm your friend on Facebook, well, and right. I'm like, and even, I've never met you before. But, you know, well, when you <laughs> cringe and say, Mom, friend, yeah. <laughs> you know, well, when that's those, a, when those weak ties get dragged across time and made present when they should have died. Right. For example, friends from high school. Right. There's a reason you're not friends with those people from high school right. anymore, because you're not in high school anymore. Right. Do you guys agree with that? And Facebook forces your whole life to exist in one moment. You are supposed to forget people. Do you know how many people? You're supposed to. I'm so serious. Yeah. I picked my nose. You're not supposed to know that. I'm a grown man now. I don't do that anymore. But do you know how many people have hooked up and got, especially older people, older people, no, I talk about my mom, she's on the internet. How many people from high school and college who have gotten back together or married or friends or other things because of Facebook? <laughs> Well, because it, of it social can, media. It can happen, yeah. but it happens within a snowstorm of, you know, again, weak ties. It happens within this extraordinary tsunami of um, not only, you know, diffusion, but yeah. also snippet-type relationships. So, Pete, when we were talking in, in, out back in the, in the green room, <laughs> and we said, <laughs> I took you to the woodshed. By the, shed. By the woodshed. <laughs> we were talking in the green room, and I said, uh, I feel like I have a split personality. Like, I'm not my avatar. Like, people will, will see me in the grocery store and say, I saw you at Whole Foods. And I said, well, why didn't you come up and say hello? And he said, I just want to tweet you. And so, you know, so it's almost like we have split personalities. Is it, do you think it is helping with the fabric of society, or, or are we sort of skimming the surface? Are we really interacting with each other with social media? I think, well, I'm friends with everybody on the internet, so. <laughs> <laughs> it's this weird kind of fame where, like, when we were walking through the airport today, people were like, come on over and try to go to Chili's 2 with me or whatever. Um, <laughs> but are you, are you going to do that? No, I mean, I think that, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, queso, maybe. Yeah. Uh, I will. <laughs> I think that it's empowered people in, um, in great ways. Like, uh, you look at the, the Arab Spring or Occupy Wall Street, and you, you hear this, this voice of, of, of dissonance, and you, and you see that, that David's kind of gotten a voice finally. Um, but I think it's empowered people in strange ways as well, where people will just come on my at replies and be like, you look so bloated when you left Starbucks today. I'm like, 
Well, yeah. like, <laughs> yeah. breaking yeah. news. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you we're, would never say that to me in person. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's just, and well, we're, maybe we're, we're reading ahead because we are going to talk about the Arab Spring. We're going to talk about, the, and you mentioned it a little bit when you talked about the earthquake in Haiti yeah. and, and, and hurricanes and all of that. Yes. It's given the, the, my, the vocal minority seems, to, it's amplified the voice. Mm -hmm. But isn't that just something that is just the internet, the anonymity of the internet, even if your name is up there or you have a handle? It's, you're still anonymous, pretty much. It's yeah, like I mean, I think that it's gotten to the point where people can be so anonymous. You know, you can be, right. you can, you can get online and you can feel so disconnected to this other human being that you can right. say whatever you're going to say. And well, I think it's... Yeah, in, in village life, you live, breathe, and died with people who you knew for 100 years. They knew your family for 700 years. And you could never re escape your reputation. The flip side of that is now, what reputation? I've got 18 different reputations and 62 different personalities and avatars. So it's it's good, except at the extremes. You know, it's got great potential. Again. And, and that's true. I think that's true with everything, right? Yeah. Donuts are great, yeah. except <laughs> in the extreme. And right. even in the extreme, they're still delicious. You know right. what I mean? Like they're still always really they kill you, but they're they're right. good. You want them? <laughs> I, I'm sorry, stand by, yeah. Nicole. I can't hear you. I'm sorry. What were you saying? Look, my brain is right there. <laughs> are, you tell, are you telling to move on? Okay. <laughs> the IFB. This sign, this this sign is does so not mean keep it going. <laughs> Universal. I don't know much about TV. I'm all, I am very, very transparent. My book is named Transparent. Nicole Dow, <laughs> stand up. Nicole Dow is, um, she produced all of this. She has called me every hour for the last week and checked in with, did you read that? Did you get that? I have it. So she's my brain. This is how it works. I'm wearing this little earpiece right here. She's telling me what, everything that I have to say. Okay, so let's, let's, let's move on real quick. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a couple of stats, more stats. Internet users over the age of 55 are driving the growth of social networking through the mobile internet. And that's according, that's the source is Nielsen. Close to 40% of social media users access social media content on their mobile phones. Source again, Nielsen. And when I read that, 55, over the age of 55, are driving the growth of social networking through the mobile internet. And I wonder, I wonder if this target audience that we have that's, you know, 18 to 40, if it's off. Because I see that people who are older are really, they're rocking it when it comes to social media. So my question is, are we losing touch? We can, are we losing touch? Are we more disconnected? Or are we actually more connected? I mean, can we quantify that? Is there a way to quantify it? I think we're both. Yeah. You know, I think one of the, the, the key pairings you see in these age groups, and yet, first of all, the focus on 18 to 25 or 35, that's advertising driven. And they got all those people earlier. You know, Facebook started in college age demographic, and so the growth today, 10 years later, is going to be at the upper end. So it's not to forget that. But if you watch an ad on the internet, you're yeah. an idiot. I just have to say that. <laughs> <laughs> who, who does not mute the ad? Is there anyone that sits through an ad on the internet? I can't say That's anything. Crazy that is, I love our advertisers who advertise on, on CNN.com. We love their ads. They're phenomenal. I'm riveted. <laughs> but one of the, right, one of the, right Susan? Yeah. One of the strong ties, to get back to the, the good side of it, that you see is, is kids and their grandparents. Yeah. Right? Especially because we don't, again, we don't live as close together as we used to. Having that Skype video, that chat, seeing the photos of the kid that you're not necessarily around, that's, you know, a very new but old thing that technology has allowed us to kind of reclaim for my lost connections and, yeah. and a good, strong connection that yeah. enables. I, just, I have to, I have to, I love social media. I started doing it before we actually integrated it at CNN, but anonymously. Like I had a fake handle, right? And then all of a sudden we could do it on what TV. What was your name? I'm like, what? what? I can't, I'm not telling you that. <laughs> I actually created a, an anonymous one for, I don't think he'd mind, for Wolf Blitzer to see how he would like yeah. Twitter. To, and so I, maybe he played, I don't know played around for a little bit and then got his own CNN handle, but um, it's, it's amazing to actually be able to do it on a platform like CNN. We, we, sh we should talk about that a little bit later. We should also talk about presence, you know, the idea of what is togetherness. Mm -hmm. Again, the, this thing, this animal social media washes into the moment when we are together. I think it's really important to think about the idea of punctured <laughs> presence. Yeah, You're reading my mind, because that's, that's what I'm thinking. How many, how often are you talking to people and they're like, yeah, well, right. yeah. I mean, anybody here to, you know, something called Blackberry Orphans? And then you get their update as you're they're, talking to them. <laughs> right. They're like, the pass kids, the salt. The kids, you know, Sweet. we used to hide our parents' cigarettes, and, and now kids are hiding their parents' Blackberries. They're yeah. really, they're trying to flush them down the toilets and things like that. It says something about when we are together, 
are we together? Yeah. And so, you know, it's not that it's bad and being together is good. It's not that, you know, checking things is bad. But again, it's that degree, are you ever, you know, in eye contact? And we were talking earlier yeah. back there about the, you know, what, what is the influence on kids today who are growing up in this milieu and their social skills, ability to have eye contact. You were sure, saying. I mean, well, for me, I mean, I remember even a few years ago, we treated social media conversations like they weren't real life. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I'm saying they're real. Like, my friends online are really my friends. Yeah. And so there are people, when I wake up in the morning, there are people I look forward to seeing what they're saying, seeing what they're doing. And when we interact, it's very real. I mean, I remember a few years ago, we kind of treated it like it wasn't the case, but there really isn't a line between my life online and my life offline. It's, it's the same thing. And so even if I may not see you for months and months, our interactions online are very real. And so I, mean, I have four kids and for them, it's just life altogether. And so it, life online, life offline, they don't, they don't really see lines of demarcation. I think it's gonna be the same way uh, moving forward for sure. Hang on, I yeah. think that's a very good point because I said I have, feel like I have a split personality probably because I'm not young enough to not know the internet. I mean, to, yeah, to not know the internet. Like kids don't know the world without the internet, right? right. Or right. without social media. But I remember a time when you had to call someone and say, hey, let's go to a bar and meet up and hang out. And it wasn't a cell phone. Yeah, I mean, I was on the internet in high school and so I'm 32 now. So, I mean, the net has always been kind of a fact yeah. of life for me too. And so, I mean, I went to school here at Morehouse and I remember when we first put uh, high speed internet on campus. And so for us, the internet's always been real. And so it's not, it's not like my online life and offline life is just real all the time. I think the drawback of that is I'm always on. But do you know everyone you, you talk to or communicate with, or all of your followers or friends? Well, I mean, knowing is relative. I mean... Like, personally, have you met them? No, I haven't met. I have, definitely haven't met. I mean, it's tens of thousands of people, but the thing is, like, when I say when it makes your world smaller, there may be somebody in Albuquerque, New Mexico, that without the Internet... I never would have made a personal connection with them, but both of us have a passion for humanitarian causes. Mm -hmm. And so I feel closer to that person in Albuquerque, New Mexico, than I do my, uh, my Uncle Wayne, who is my mother's brother, but we have nothing in common. Yeah. Right, and right. so, I mean, the tendency is to think that these offline relationships are closer and more real, but some of the people, uh, thousands of the people that I'm connected with online, those relationships are like very valuable to me. I think that, yeah, that's amazing. How many of you have uh, internet access at home? Raise your hands. That's just about everybody. At, how many of you are, are social media access at home? At work? <laughs> More people at work. <laughs> and how many of you access it uh, via your phones? All right, good. All right, because that's good. I'm glad you guys could good segue to some stats. 52% of Facebook users Go ahead. and 33% of Twitter users engage with the platform daily. 53% of Facebook, 33% of Twitter, compared to 7% of MySpace and 6% of LinkedIn users. What are we, what's going on? Somebody here? They're ridiculing MySpace. Yeah, don't do that. Come on. Um, so... I think it's important that what you said, because, because of our online and offline lives being merged. And while I'm an early adapter, I didn't see the significance of Facebook until recently, because it was so scattered for me that I had like eight Facebook pages that people had created and whatever. I, so I sort of didn't get Facebook. But I'm on Twitter a lot as someone in the media, someone who's, Facebook feels more personal then, especially for, for someone who doesn't have a lot of time, Twitter is like instant. But Facebook feels more personal. So do you feel a personal connection even to people you haven't met, even to your fans, Pete? Uh, I think that one of the things that if you're going to be like a gatekeeper on the internet, it should be your job to make the connections more personal. Um, so I think that some of the things that people you know, like, it's great to have a lot of followers or, you know, whatever it is, but I think that uh, it's important to understand that social media is a conversation, and if you're not listening to what's being said as well, um, I don't know that you're really grasping what social, the way social media should work. So, yeah, I mean, I think that I don't feel like I have um, a personal connection to everybody that follows me on the Internet, but um, the people that I'm able to engage with, I think that it's important to, to take that tone a little bit deeper and more personal. You were saying, but before I, I read I think stats. a lot of this is about potential. 
right? We have the potential to find common connections that were not immediately available to us in our geography. If you are a homosexual kid in a small community with not a lot of people like you, that could be a lifeline. Mm -hmm. If you are a rebel in a country where your speech is restricted, that could be a physical lifeline. Um, could be. And you know, so you can find people in Albuquerque and you might find a fan out of the thousands who you really want to connect to. One of the, the downsides, I loved your analogy about being closer to someone in Albuquerque than the, the family member. But I've also felt a little bit of a break geographically, of a sense of place. I don't feel like I, I feel like I live on the internet. I keep my stuff in Brooklyn. I sleep there. Sure. But I know, <clears throat> I was watching minute by minute what was happening on the ground in Egypt. And I didn't know my neighbor's names on my floor. Yeah. And there is, a, there is something off about that. And it's cool, but it's also a little wrong, yeah. if not massively wrong that to invest in that weak tie such significance, which is not to deny the urgency of the Arab Spring, but to deny the urgency of knowing if I'm hurt, they can't do that much but for here's, me and my neighbors. But here's a question. Right here. so I've, listen, I've lived in New York. I've graduated school from New York. Yeah. That's New York. <laughs> no, no, so, no, does that no. mean this? But uh, that's New York. No. That's big. That's a big city. Do, do you? No. So, you, but you think social media has in, has enhanced that? Has exacerbated that issue? Well, no. The Pew study shows that whether or not you're on the net doesn't actually make a difference with whether or not you know your neighbor. There you go. Separately, mm -hmm. however, you know we all know that America doesn't know their neighbors anymore. You know, it's it's gone downhill. So you know we have this hyperactivity connectivity on steroids, and yet. Where, what are, what's going on with the strong ties? I, I think we need to think about that. Or what's and again, sorry, I'd yeah. like to revisit the, you know, that punctured presence. I, I think that's too important to, you know, overlook. The idea that when you're with your kids, you know, when you're with whoever you're with, are you giving them the gift of your attention? You know, what you pay attention to determines your life. But, okay. I agree. I agree. But and if you, at if you pay attention 80 different ways, it can be an improvement. But 100% of the time, I think it's taking away. But Maggie, by the time they're 12 or 13, they're probably going to have their own device. Mm -hmm. And you'll be talking to them at breakfast, and they'll be texting you. I'm not talking to you today, Mom. We're working on that. <laughs> right? Yeah, I'm working on that. No, I think it's. What, what do you I think, mean? You have a solution for all children? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just saying it's a tool. Yeah. We have to return ourselves to thinking of these things as tools and not as the holy grail or the panacea or the lifestyle because I think we can actually yeah, you know, I mean, have our strong Even ties. Maggie and I said earlier, offline relationships are way more difficult than online relationships. Mm -hmm. like I can. I can, you can tweet me at 9 a.m. and I might not tweet you back until 9 p.m. But if you came to me face to face at 9 a.m. and I waited until 9 p.m. to respond, I mean, it would, be, it would be a problem. And so, like, even with what Baratunde said, I mean, I had a, like a tragic moment where I, I live in Midtown Atlanta where we had elderly neighbors and she came and she knocked on our door and said that her husband had just died. Mm. And I remember having the thought that I didn't know her husband's name. And so I was trying like this humiliating game of learning her husband's name. And this lady had lived next door to me for two years. And so it takes way more effort to build relationships with people offline, but it's still not that much effort. And so, I mean, I, I felt, you know, terrible because I have all of these online connections but I think we are stunted in some ways with our in, uh, basic interpersonal skills. Yeah. And uh, it's, it, I, I don't think it's a good thing. I don't know how we, how we get back there. Well, well, I think we'll also get better at it. We're, this is so young, relative to the history of humanity. Sure. Right. This is a second. And when we learn to navigate this new networked world with social media and all the information we have access to, we don't know how to process that. Yeah. We literally need digital helpers to filter that existence. And that's why, that's why you, aren't you a digital helper? That's why we're here. No, I'm talking about machines. Yeah, yes. I think we're going to come to a day seriously where you're going to think about it. You're like, yeah. oh, I need to tweet Bob, tweet Bob. No, what Bob. I, I'll I look at this room yeah. and I'll have a little heads up display and it'll tell me there are five people here who follow you on Twitter. There are oh, three people here who read already. your blog. Yeah. <laughs> and, and there are two yeah. people here who like the same thing you do. Well, hang on, so you, right. you have that already? Yeah, I've, I'm locked in right now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm in the grid. No, tell us about it. <laughs> <I'm trying. laughs> Real quickly, we're gonna move on to, to a, a, another subject, but tell us how that worked. Oh, I don't really have it. 
You know, yeah, oh. <laughs> CNN, He's really man, tweeting this. Yet. <laughs> well, it's I not that, you it's had, not that far you away. No, it's not. not. <laughs> that tells you. Well, Facebook says that. When I yeah. checked in on Facebook, it said there are 17 other people who are in the same venue as you. That's what I thought you were talking oh, about. Yeah. Come on, man. Oh, but I said heads up display, man. I, I, I talked about no, donuts. Funny. Like the, I mean, like the already, 3D glasses you get with a 3D yeah. television. I, I, it, it's fantastic that, you know, when for, they're now working on device implanted you know, uh, devices yeah. that can help quadriplegic people and paraplegic people, um, you know, think, uh, move the computer with their thoughts. That's really, you know, fantastic. It can change humanity, our definition of humanity yeah. and our, our definition of physicality, because we're really talking about where is the future of the biological and is the, bi is the virtual going to supersede the biological? Yeah. Do we need both? Do we, we, do we hang on to the archaicness of flesh and blood, or can we get better? You know, there are people who think that this is passe. Yeah. Well, that, that, that's, a good, passe. that's a good segue <laughs> into our next subject. Pete Wentz has to leave, but thank you, sir, for joining us. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, wow, <laughs> under the bus. <laughs> <laughs> so we're, we're going to talk, let's talk about that, about, about social is isolation, right? The average social networking site user has more close ties and is half as likely. Half, it's the opposite of what you think. Half as likely to be socially isolated as the average American. Yeah. So the more, no, that, that, that's not the more you're online, hang on, the more you have a social networking connection. Yeah. Some 85% agreed with that statement. Mm -hmm. This is from the poll, uh, from the Pew study. Uh, I see, there's mostly been a positive force in the social world. That's what they believe. Some say, some 14% agreed with the opposite statement. I see that the internet has mostly been a negative force on my social world, 14%. So, with the popularity of social media, um, does the adage, no man is an island, does that still hold true? And a continuation of what you were saying. Yeah, of course it does. And I'm skeptical about sort of, you know, are you happy, aren't you happy kind of survey data like that. That doesn't drill down to everything about we, what we've been talking about. That doesn't drill down to whether you know your neighbor, it doesn't drill down to, you know, how you feel on a certain day and things like that. So I think, uh, you know, a, well, a one, uh, but I think it's, I think it's is because, it better, is it not? I'm not, well, hang I'm on. skeptical about hang that. Hang on, but I think it's what, what he's saying is that he didn't know his neighbor's name. Mm -hmm. So was he isolating himself at home and in his own little bubble, even though he is social media, social networking, to the world, right. but they said, you would think that because people are so connected that they're sitting in their homes and they're just on social media, but right. they're, not, they're not as likely. People on social media will go out to dinner, will go out to eat, will go out for drinks, will meet people. Right, I mean, but it's really hard to get the true picture from one survey question. That, you know, we can't just then automatically say it's all positive or not. I mean, there are, there are, there's a lot of red flags about you know, social isolation in the United States despite all the positives about social media. You know, they, as we were saying before, they might bring a certain type of connectivity to your life, and yet it won't get you over the doorstep of you know, creating those deep friends. And often, um, you know, for instance, or we're skipping to you know, a certain type of relationship, which is the inventive, innovative, creative relationship. Studies show that when scientists work um, you know, in proximate, to each other, they're more, they're st they publish more papers, they, you know, produce more things. The further across the, you know, across the physicality that they move, the less that they're inventive together. So those ties, you know, those rich kind of face-to-face -face ties, um, you know, still happen when we are together. And I think that, you know, there is, there is something to be said for that kind of flesh and blood, you know, togetherness. When, when you work in your field as a blogger, I know a number of bloggers, usually they can go into work and they can work at home a couple days a w week if they want. Do you relate to what she's saying? Or do you find yourself being more productive? I, I have a friend who's a blogger at Gawker, mm -hmm. and she says, she's on my show, and she, she says, I am more productive when I go into the office and everything is all set up than when I'm at home. My editor can always tell when I'm at home because there are so many mistakes. Do you relate to what you're I, saying? No, I do relate to it. I think we're, there are shades here. We're talking about shifting an emphasis of the mm -hmm. muscles we use, the physical muscles we use, the emotional and social muscles we use. I understand someone answering that survey I, in the way they did it because I feel it. When you, you, connection is a feeling. 
beyond physical, it's emotional. Can you feel love? Can you laugh? Can you feel pain? Can you feel vengeance through some virtual thing? Of course you can. If you feel those things, you are not isolated. Whether it came from a video from a friend on Skype or whether it came from a, a text message is less important than if it came from your neighbor. So I think that there is value to that and that, that lack of isolation is real. I personally love working in a workspace with other people because I like hitting people in the head, I like playing jokes on people, I would like drinking whiskey together That's at work. not productive. You know, it's, but it's not all about productivity. It's all about, <laughs> you know, feeling productive yeah. is what's important. Go ahead, Pete. You were going to say? <laughs> I think that, uh, like, to the no man is an island, I think it, that the internet just made the island way more awesome. And, like, uh, <laughs> it feels like, uh, you know, w whatever the case may be, I think that the, the internet informs whatever your personality is, so it just enhances it. So if you're a narcissistic person, you're not going to go on the internet and finally realize that the world's larger than you, you're going to go on there and take pictures from a weird angle and post them on your Facebook or whatever. <laughs> you know? and, uh, I think that the interesting thing is that I have friends who are like kind of my friends who I just follow them on the internet and then like I can see that they like, you know, like whatever, ran some errands and went to FedEx Day and like I don't need to talk to them. That's great. That's all like the level of friendship that I need from them. And I just kind of wonder without the internet would I check in? And then the other thing that I think about is that like since it hasn't been around that long, I don't know that we really know how long things last on the internet. Like the internet could possibly be ink. So things that you put out on the internet may just last forever, you know, and, and, and no one knows because it's not that old. So it's, it's just kind of an interesting thing because I think people think that, because it, it, it's so immediate, people think that it's temporary, but it's not, you know. You said the inter internet might, might just be it? Ink. Like I feel ink. like it might just, oh, gotcha. it, I mean like I just wonder whether the things that you put on the internet will stay around forever. Because it's like I got people that, talk to me about stuff that I did on the internet like 10 years ago. I'm like, ah, oh, I don't really know what I was doing then. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Which is something that, especially young people, I guess everybody has to be careful. I mean, oh, definitely. Look, look I mean, at, I think, yeah. I mean, look at Anthony Weiner, right? <laughs> so, I mean, just, just being honest, it's not like a secret, right? It's not a secret. Um, so let's, let's, talk, let's talk about young people. We talked a little bit about people who have always known the internet since they've been. What do you think it does to this new generation growing up um, now, do you think that you think it helps or hurts? Well, with I think it helps. I mean, I think it helps. I mean, even like with my kids at home, they already see themselves as like global citizens because not only do they see me or, or their mom interacting with people all over the world, they see how easy it is. But, I mean, even though it's kind of like what Bar what Baratunde <coughs> said, you know, home is kind of like where we keep our stuff, but now the world is ours, and so for my kids, I mean, they see that. Um, connecting with people all over the world, even through, I mean, I've showed them ways to connect with people in other languages through Google Translate or whatever. And so for them, uh, they see themselves already as citizens of the world. And so, I mean, I think they too, though, are going to have kind of acute challenges connecting with people offline because all they've ever known is uh, tweeting. And like my oldest daughter uh, has a cell phone. And so already she's she's texting and then, she? uh, she's 12 and then I see in the quality of her writing that her internet speak has kind of dumbed down the quality of her writing and so uh, you know tweets don't lend themselves to being uh, a great writer does and anyone so, else does anyone find themselves writing and work or formally with you why instead of y-o-u yeah. the letter u or uh, instead of a-r-e-r I find myself doing that at work. And, and is that okay, you know? Like, is it okay? I'm, I'm, I'm constantly, when I'm texting somebody, I'm asking myself, is it inappropriate for me to use just the letter U right here? But I mean, or, is it, or, or are they gonna think less of me, you know, or, you know, I mean, seriously, like, just yes. depending on who it is. Yes, I will. Yeah, but, well, <laughs> I, I, I already you, do. I kid you not, <laughs> I kid you not, I, I'm gonna tell you why I asked that question. It's not, it doesn't have anything to do with this. But an, an English teacher, sent me a Facebook, Facebook language, Twitter language, completely different, right? Mm -hmm. So it said, Don, you have all these um, you misspellings and typos when you're writing because my Twitter updates my Facebook. So the people on Facebook yeah. are going, what the heck is he talking about? Yeah. And the people on Twitter get it. So I sent it back to him saying, you know, with the misspelling saying it's social, and he goes, oh, now I get it. But the reason I ask you that question is because we're old enough to get it. We've had that formal training. For the young people, that it's, it's a completely different story. It's kind of like my handwriting. Like, I, I tried to write my wife a note on a birthday card recently, and I realized that I hadn't written anything, like, by hand in so long that I just, like, I just decided to write, like, one sentence instead of five. <laughs> and so 
our What's kids, up? our kids, are, it's going to be that way. Like if it's that way with me, and I actually learned penmanship. It's going to be magnified exponentially with, with the younger generation. They don't teach it in school. Some, well, think, some schools don't teach it anymore. I right. think short isn't necessarily worse. And <laughs> right. also, language has always changed. Yeah. I mean, language will, but it, it, the point really at the heart of it is whether or not we can clearly communicate. Right. And right. whether or not we think first before we write that one sentence or the five sentences. I mean, I think, you know, we have to, I believe, um, you know, have a value system that finds benefit in the speed, in the brevity, in the efficiency, but doesn't disparage the ability to sit and de daydream, you know, the ability to sit under a tree and do little. We've got to move on, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> that was enough. Crap. She's the producer. Man. If, you, if ever you guys see us on television, we're talking, we, we do this, we go, uh, so someone's going, rap, you're killing me. That's someone like her. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to ask you this, and we're going to go on a Q&A, because we are, uh, the conversation is good, so they let us go a little bit long. But what I want to ask is, you said that there is, what did you call it, a dark, or an impending dark age? <laughs> and, I mean, is it, have we <laughs> reached a point where, is there going to be, like, the housing market, like, is a bubble going to burst someplace? And if so, when is that going to happen? Yeah, I did. Uh, exactly when. The, the subtitle of my book, Dark Age Does Figure, it <laughs> wasn't a chicken little comment. Uh, I did a lot of research after hearing these incredibly brilliant people like Umberto Eco, Jane Jacobs, talk about dark ages, and I, and I tried to sort of investigate it myself. Dark ages throughout history have often been highly technological, which is really interesting, inventive, you know, the stirrup, the compass, the university, the banking system with the Greeks, you know, all sorts of things happen in dark ages, and yet when you look at the parallels, it's actually pretty interesting to our time. Dark ages are also times, ultimately, of cultural forgetting. You know, can we have a conversation? Do we know how to turn data into knowledge, into wisdom? You know, the sorts of things, social skills. So when you look at some of the things we might be forgetting and what's being lost, um, I think that it might be a darkening time. You know, is the choice ours to have both depth and um, you know, speed, speed yeah. and brevity? I think it truly is. So I'm, you know, I don't think the sky's falling. But I think that, um, hey, look around, you know, did the financial systems actually pay attention? You know, did people actually think before the algorithms? Things like that yeah. make you wonder. I just, I just wonder if, I think that, you know, my Louisiana background, just because the gumbo is bigger doesn't mean it's better. I mean, you have to have more, the more ingredients you have in it, the better it is, right? So it doesn't mean that it's, it's thick and rich just because it's bigger, just because we can be connected right. to the world, yeah. doesn't mean that it's helping us or tastes better or that it feels better in actuality in our lives. First of all, you just made me very hungry. Uh, yeah. I did not eat dinner and I love gumbo. The, I think to your point, there is some other risk. One is, is the isolation of your own type with your own type. Homophilia. Right, we see that with our political tastes, like liberals read liberal stuff, conservative read conservative stuff, and the internet accelerates that natural tendency. We don't bump across discordant ideas yeah. because the algorithms that drive us mm -hmm. self-select those away from us. You don't like that, therefore, you don't need that in your life. And that's a very different value statement. Like versus need, um, want versus need. And children learn that early on, and maybe this is gonna help them forget that. Yeah. And we also have all these recording tools politically we know from history, but we don't actually apply it. I feel like the more recording we have, we know exactly what happened. We have footage, 3D surround sound. And we keep repeating these mistakes even more because we're so in the high speed now, the instant, even if we look at coverage of big events. I'm going to throw in some questions myself, but I'm going to let the audience and then I'll throw in some. So who has, do we have a first question somewhere? Are we going to raise the house? How are we going to do this? Is there a mic? There's a mic over there. Anybody has a question? There's mics. Should they walk to the mic? Done. You can yeah. mic here. There's a mic here. And you can walk over to the mic and we will take your question. We're also going to be taking some questions. Guess what? on social media. <laughs> Hello, my Hello. name is Sarah DeThomasis, and I actually work in social media. So, so if you ask if we're on social media networks at work, in fact, I am all day, every day. Um, my question actually is for Pete. Um, I know that you're very obviously involved in music social media, and that's something that especially for artists and bands these days is becoming really, really important and huge to how they appear to the public and driving their fan growth in real life as opposed to also online. 
Do you see anyone who's doing what you think is a really good job or someone who you think that we could really learn from in maybe a negative way where to grow from? Or do you think that, you know, you're doing a really good job? Um, and where do you see maybe it going in the future? Uh, I, see, I see a lot of people doing um, great jobs. I think Questlove does a great job. I think um, Trent Reznor does a great job. Um, and they're, they're very different, I think, and it depends on who you are as an artist. I think when you're a new artist, new artist in the digital age, I think it's vastly different probably than um, coming before that. And I think that the interesting thing is with, with the internet and social media, it can be, I think, a really powerful tool, but I think people are able to skew numbers in different ways, and I think that uh, it's made people a lot lazier. Like, in some ways, it's leveled the playing field, and, like, a kid from Arkansas is, you know, is, is just as big a voice as somebody in Los Angeles or New York, but I think that lots of times kids are like, ah, oh, yeah, I got all this stuff on the internet, whatnot, you know, whatever, but it's like, at some point, you still need to go get in a van, and you still need to play in front of people, so I think it's important to have the balance of both, and remember that you don't only exist on the internet, but um, I think social media has been a, a great tool for, for me and for bands that I work with, for sure. Thanks. Awesome. Anyone on this side? Go ahead, young lady. Hello. Um, hello. Okay, great evening, everyone. Um, I just wanted to ask the question to Baratunde. Um, I was recently reading the African American Consumer Report from Nielsen. And from where? N Nielsen. Okay. And I would like to question, you know, being that we're at Morehouse and how African American um, people are using the internet and its influence. From my perspective, um, I don't think that they're using it as um, affluent as they could be. The the some of the hashtags that come up on Twitter are very inappropriate at times and very uh, racially driven. And I just wanted to get your thoughts about that. Black Twitter. <laughs> uh, uh, who, who asked you that question backstage? Out back. Out back. By the shed. Don asked me about Blitter. Um, I, I, have, uh, I have several minds on this. What's your name? Um, it's Brittany. Brittany, yeah. thank you for the question. Uh, I got a little frustrated with the media attention around how black people use Twitter, because I thought a lot of it was just like, ooh, how, how do white people use Twitter? They type into a box and press send. You know, it's like, how do, how do Latinos eat tacos? I don't know, you just put it in your mouth and you chew. Like, it's not that deep. <laughs> to some degree, it's not that deep. I think what, there certainly is a higher proportion of black people on Twitter. I have theories and no solid explanation about why some of those topics trend going back to a type of socialness and a type of participatory game that Twitter lends itself to. Yeah. Twitter is short, Twitter is quips, Twitter is, rewards wit and cleverness and speed and piling on. Yeah. And there is, a, there is a subset of the black cultural experience which revolves around that too. <laughs> I, I want to be wary of saying like, black people use Twitter like this because you can find millions of exceptions, and if there are millions of exceptions, you can't say black people, black people breathe, <laughs> you know? And, and there's, there's something, so I, I think that's, that's a part of it. Also, it depends on the algorithms that are powering it. Um, I also, here's, what's in, here's what interests me about it, rather than rambling for too long. What Twitter does, it does, I don't really think it necessarily creates a new culture, but I think it may just expose a thing that we didn't see. This happens in person, maybe on the stoop, maybe on the train, maybe at work where you're supposed to be working. Okay. And because it's different, you're bas basically Twitter threw a camera into a culture. It threw a camera into Libya. It threw a camera into Haiti. It throws a camera into certain aspects of black culture. And we are not used to seeing that. And so we react like, whoa, that's wrong. That's not my blackness. That, that makes me look bad. I feel some shame. Ooh, look at what black people do. And so you write these 5,000 word thought pieces about what black people do on Twitter. Or you feel a little disappointed as a black person because that's, that's not how you think it should be used. Or it doesn't reflect your experience of being black. Yeah. Can I jump in here? No. Because in case keep you going. haven't noticed that, yeah. I'm black. <laughs> Here's the thing, though. And I don't think that, I think that it's just working in media. Yeah. I, I remember there was a time when we were concerned about minorities and African Americans not having access to the internet. So when, in the advent of social media, to have African Americans participating in Twitter 
more than any other social networking type. I think that's important to point out. Mm -hmm. What is it about that culture that draws them to that? I do happen to think it's a little bit like in Living Color, sitting on the stoop. Hey, babe, no, nothing bad about Miss Jenkins except maybe a breath, right? That sort of thing. Yeah. And there is that part, <laughs> seriously, there is that part of black culture that is like that. Yeah. But I think Pete, the uh, reason that mostly white people on Facebook <laughs> are a, the, the largest portion is because uh, <laughs> <laughs> what? Uh, he, yeah. he, he told me backstage. He, he told me backstage. People, oh, tell oh, me, oh, come on. Tell the truth. <laughs> you said white people you. like to talk. Yeah. I, mean, I, think, <laughs> I think speaking to that, I think that you can just kind of <laughs> as do black. You can ramble on Facebook, and it, you have to be a little more concise, or you have to get on like Twit longer or whatever. Um, but I think the other thing with with topics trending and stuff. I feel like a, a large proportion of kids in the suburbs really look to black culture. So when you see something trending, you're like, wow, that's way cooler than I could yeah. say it. So I'm going to go after, you know, like, yeah. I think that. Like hip hop sales. It's almost, it's like All this has happened before. It's almost like hip hop or like gospel or where you create, where Twitter has created a, a different language. And African Americans have done that among swag themselves. Again and there's, on Twitter there's and some I'd be swag. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's some, it's, it's like, it, there's some swag because you have to, there's this language and you have to shorten everything. So it's almost like a rap thing, like, quick, you know, if you like something, you say, that's bad as you know what, pound awesome or whatever, pound cool or whatever. Facebook, it's not like that. It's like, hey, here's my girlfriend from high school, remember this? And you're like, <gasps> actually, I throw a lot of hashtags at Facebook just because. Just, <laughs> yeah, I'm a rebel. I'm a rebel. What can I say? Hashtag that's what I do. Hashtag that's how I run. <laughs> I do hashtags and emails sometimes. Does anybody, do you want to answer that? Anyone? Anyone? Bueller? Well, yeah, I mean, it's just, Bueller? You know, black culture is so rich, and it just, on, on Twitter, it gets magnified. I, mean, I think it is what Baratuni said. I mean, people are always looking to, uh, even what Pete said, people are always looking to the city uh, to get the trend. And so, I mean, I mean, I've, been, I've been on Twitter before and seen five of the top 10 trending topics in the country being like highly specific black trending topics. BET like reruns at two in the morning. Yeah, yeah, I mean just something, and it's just, uh, I, I think it is a great thing. I think it also deals with the fact that even though you may go into the inner city and everybody may not have a, a laptop, most of the kids in the inner city are, are doing it on their mobile phones. And so because mobile phones are so cheap and text messages are so cheap, folk can just get right on. And I mean, it's mainly using Twitter is, is way more affordable yeah. than using all the other tools as well. And it's, what I, what I, it's, may, it's way, it's friendlier it's, yeah. and easier that way. What I want to see is, you know, we've talked a lot about using, 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 building, building. Like, where, like, are these new tech users becoming developers, becoming programmers, becoming designers? and building the next thing that everybody's gonna be on talking to their grandmother with, or talking about what they saw on television last night with. And I think we have some tendency to get really excited about usage and less insistent upon creation and investment and building. Yeah, that's good. All right, I'm looking for online questions. I'm gonna, add, I'm gonna let you guys do one and then I'm gonna get some questions from social media. I'm checking them as, I'm, so I am paying attention but kind of not. Go ahead. Hi, yeah. Hi, y'all. First, thank you so much for an interesting discussion tonight. My name is Daniel Rivers. I'm a fellow with the James Weldon Johnson Institute. And, you know, I guess it struck me as I, I was listening to you all talk, I'm going to assume that all five of you actually live in, in large metropolitan areas. And I think that it's interesting that we've spoken so much about the city tonight, right? We've really been talking about the city about how social relations in the city do or don't break down as a result of the internet. And to borrow another scholar's term, I might argue that we're suffering a little bit from something that this scholar would call metronormativity, in that we're not really looking outside the city and we're focusing so much on that. And with that in mind, there was a, there was a great article a couple weeks ago in the New York Times, and the article was on this, this social networking site that is operative in, uh, particularly in small rural southern towns called Topics. And people are finding, the article in the Times said that actually what's happening uh, through the Topics usage, and I'm talking about towns of one and 2,000 people, really small towns where everybody does know everybody, where it is still a village, right? And that actually Topics remains anonymous. Um, and people are using topics to actually destroy other people's reputation in these tiny towns so that a small town culture of gossip that 
that may always have existed in American culture, what, right? What's the question? I, I don't want to, what's yeah. the question? So the question is, what does that make us look at, right? Number one, it makes us look at anonymity and accountability. And, and where does social networking answer to that, right? If people can destroy other people in, in an anonymous way, is that dangerous? And then also, are there ways in which social networking actually increases and intensifies known insularity of small spaces, right? You want to you want to answer that, Maggie? Sure. Um, well, I mean, I think it, you. it highlights the um, dangers of anonymity that we have been talking about, um, and you know, maybe it means something about um, the flattening of you know small town versus city. You know, maybe we are you know not they're not so distinct anymore. If you can have the anonymity of the city in this village where everybody knows each other and destroying reputations, and then you can also have a certain proximity and cohesiveness within the city because we have looked to the urbanization for such ties and values now. I mean, these are, these are sort of shifting planes of geography. Add into the mix the fact that we are kind of placeless and you get a really, you know, shifting ground here. So I'm not sure what, I mean, it is absolutely extraordinarily tragic, the dark side of the internet, the bullying, the, the, you know, the reputation, the, you know, what can go on that, that drives teenagers to suicides, you know, we can't condone that. And, you know, in a lot of ways, it always might have gone on face to face. I would like to say one thing about technology. Oh, that's good. Oh, really? <laughs> really? <I'm just> <laughs> that Don't was make so me come down there. That was that like was, a village phone. That was like a joke ring. Is that a dial phone? Does it have a rotary <laughs> dial? She yeah. carries around a rotary phone. <laughs> No, no, you have to pull no, up an no, antenna no, like no, this. No, no making fun of ringtones. That's a. Um, but I would like to say one thing again about technology and tools. You know, basically, the, the it's a fallacy that technology is neutral. We often bandy that around and think, you know, oh, it's just a tool. It depends on how we use it. These technologies all have their individual characteristics. They all have their sort of pulsing, beating ways of being in our hands and changing us as much as we might change them. And we can't forget that, you know? So I think that each, you know, and the, the important point is to use critical thinking about the tool, about the message and the medium. And that's where we can begin to push back against some of these things. I think a good job opportunity, speaking of, you know, we've been talking a lot about creating jobs is, and I know someone who's going into it is reputation. Yeah. And, um, one of, a, someone, a publicist has left the publishing, he's Howard Bragg, I don't know if you guys know him, to start a reputation.com to specifically go and fix people's online reputation. And so I think that's going to be, a, that's a place to go to, or house kids, if you, I think that's a way to, you know, to make some dough if you want. Hey, um, I, and someone, someone on Facebook asked the same thing. Why, why isn't social media a topic that's taught in college and teaching a thing that changes so much right. in, in, a, in an institution that's designed to teach deeper, longer term? Yeah, but everything changes. So. Everything, no, no, that, everything changes. I, I'm just going to argue in favor of what I, what I fear is that there's going to be like Twitter class. Like Twitter 101, it's no, advanced well, Twitter, well, yeah, it is. hashtagery, yeah. 302. I get exactly what, yeah. <laughs> like, I've, I've, I've had, I've had several education. offers to, to like write books on Twitter or Facebook, but by the time it would be published, it would be outdated. I mean, because it is changing so rapidly and in academia where you rely so heavily on the book, um, social media is changing so rapidly that the paradigm for how you would even teach a class like that would be so different. It would be very difficult for most college campuses to adapt. How, I mean, even the curriculum for the class would have to really be a, a, a work in progress. And so, I mean, but I always felt like academia was always like five to 10 years behind what, what, whatever needs to be done. If it's like, I mean, I'm still asking myself, why don't college campuses teach people how to manage their money? And it's like, that's like, that's like, that's not even new school. That's like, that, I mean, that's like a, a thousand years. College late. campuses will teach social media 50 years from now as history. Yeah. Well, I'm, but, I'm, I'm a journalist, so I'm you know really into up to the minute too. But on the other hand, the idea that academics can't keep up with 
all the different tools that are being used. Now they're studying Friendster and chat rooms and they're coming out with the longitudinal studies when we're now into you know, something totally different. And that's not anybody's fault. The second huge Rubicon we've crossed is that it used to be that you'd study one of these tools. You'd right. study how kids watch TV. Well then, you know, get a load of the six other things that they're doing at once. And so now we're having to study the totality of the ether, the environment that they're growing up in. And that is really hard to do. But there are, there is a lot of research coming out. I think we will have more classes. I think, and I think there's also kind of like an intellectual snobbery because academia didn't create Twitter. It didn't create Facebook. And most of the biggest gurus in the field of technology dropped out of college. And so you... I think you have a hesitancy on the part of the academic world to like t to just jump in head first. I mean, I, I, I don't know. Sometimes I feel like the two worlds are at odds. But and and maybe like maybe class. they're not always. <laughs> I'm sorry. I think Twitter seems like We're a great class. We're going to teach a Twitter maybe. class. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sign yeah. up for that. And that, but they're not always com they're not always compatible. But I think you can teach. So I think there is a way to teach the basics of, so of social networking. Sure. And, and maybe you teach about the internet and about anonymity and about reputation. I think you teach critical thinking. Yes. I think you teach yeah. principles yeah. that will scale yeah. across this digital camera versus the one that comes out six months later. Yeah. Right. You know? But even in, even in, even media companies, I have to say, yeah. can't keep up with social media. Yeah. But that's I mean, the it, world. It goes, that's that's it, the, the, we're the state on of the a world. Treadmill. So we have to do I it or we die. I was in elementary school a few years ago. And I found out that, you know, in elementary schools and across K through 12, there really isn't a librarian anymore. So, you know, it's really passe to have the librarian. The librarians have turned into information technologists. So I visited a PowerPoint class. Now the kids told me that they love PowerPoint because their parents were so excited. These were little kids about all the bells and whistles that they could come home with. They didn't really care about the PowerPoint or the content of what they were doing, but they knew their parents were impressed <laughs> when it went flash, 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 flash. So you sort of think, what's wrong with this picture? You know, you need to, you know, there is something called information literacy yeah, that's being yeah. taught across campuses, and so far it's pretty much fallen flat. They really need, they, you know, there needs to be more uh, critical thinking about the information literacy that it's not just a matter of pushing the buttons. Can we talk now about a little bit about instant gratification and fame heat? Uh oh. So, <laughs> what did you so do this I'm, time? In, I'm in the Apple store just yesterday and I'm buying this iMac. It's awesome. You should see it. And there are these kids who, two guys from here in Atlanta, and they go into the same little booth at the Apple store in Lenox Mall because it has speakers and they do videos. So they were doing Britney Spears or something the other day. And they film it and they put it on YouTube and they get all of these hits and they are famous. They are YouTube sensations, they're famous. What does that say about our society, this instant gratification? Are we, is it, or is it just another way to become famous or to put your particular talent out there for people to see it? No, I mean, I think it's given the, like the lowest common denominator is definitely able to do, you know, you don't really need talent to do whatever you're doing. But I think that the, this kind of fame is so, it, it moves so fast and it's so fleeting that, you know, you know, these things that happened a month ago that seemed like they were going to be like the biggest thing, I think they've just moved on and everybody essentially culturally has forgotten about it. You know, I think that... It's uh, like candy. It's like good. It tastes good, but then it's like gum. It yeah, tastes I mean, I, I, I think that, uh, I think that it's strange as a, that as a culture we keep kind of rewarding or paying attention to this stuff, you know, and, and sometimes I think, am I like, am I looking at it in an ironic way or am I like, I'm like a part of it now because if, if you're giving it a view, then you're just a part. It doesn't, like, no one asks you, like, you don't take an IQ test to go on the internet, so yeah. I think that, um, fortunately. <laughs> <Can> I, <can laughs> I does, it help, does it help, though, I have to, with your fame? Does it help, does it create fame, more fame for you or... I don't know. I mean, I think it's it's like one aspect of it. I don't think about it too much. And my I was able to like about like three months ago just kind of stop looking at myself on the internet or anything about it. And I feel a lot better to be honest with you. You know, um, it was after watching. I watched and this speaks to the point of uh, topics earlier. Was I watched this documentary called We Live in Public, and uh, it just essentially to break it down. This guy ends up having um, a bunch of people kind of live in this bunker underground, and they essentially are are like a real life version of the internet and they're filmed all the time and it really just devolves into people being naked with guns and it gets broke you know they, like literally they that's get, our future guys yeah, they, <laughs> and, and look I think, hard i think 
we're, if we're think not, about I mean, if you're not careful about it, I mean, I think that it's, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, when you're, when you're raising, when you're raising children, it's the values you instill in your, your child, like your child's going to be a citizen of the globe. If you instill that in them, you know, um, and, and I think that it's really important that we police ourselves so nobody else really has to police us, you know. We can be citizen paparazzi or we can be citizen responsible citizens of the globe. And also, don't you want to be known for the quality of your music, not for how famous you are? Yeah. Right? <laughs> He's like, oh no. <laughs> How do I answer this one? <laughs> Great. Are you going to answer it? <laughs> no, I mean, I definitely, I, I think, I definitely think so. But when like people, famous for the quality of your music, rather than famous for, just for being, being famous. famous. No, I definitely think so. But I, I think that when you're walking through the airport, or whatever you're like, I think nine times out of ten, the people that come up to you or have seen you on the, doing this on the internet or whatever it is, and that's why I think that having that, that one out of 10 interaction is really great, and you, have, you meet somebody where you actually have, have a real conversation and they appreciate whatever you've done. I think that's, that's awesome and it's cool. Yeah. Someone have a question on this side? Go ahead. Um, hi, my name is Rebecca. Can you get closer to the mic? Oh, sorry. Not um, that close. <laughs> good, good. <laughs> Come on. Um, hi, my name is Rebecca, and as a young person, my life is on the internet. I'm always involved in internet things, and um, I was just wondering, what do you think is too much information to put out onto the internet? Because I put everything out on the when internet. When you define nudity, nudity, <laughs> too much. No, no, not that. I, not that. There's um, for those anyone in this room, you're going to be interested in a couple of things. There's a book by Nick Bilton called I Live in the Future and Here's How It Works. Highly recommend you read it. He's a tech writer for the New York Times. There's a woman named Dana Boyd, D-A-N-A-H, B-O-Y-D. She works for Microsoft Research. She studies how young people use the internet and she's very smart about how she talks about it. There's so much context missing from the questions, so you have to add that to it when you're at, trying to answer it for yourself. A lot of parents in the initial years freaked out, like my kid's hanging on the internet, some dude's gonna show up in a van, and like, do, you know, take them to the bagel shop or something. The weird things are going to happen. That would be a weird thing if you want to take your kid to the bagel shop. But the point is, you know, these kids were not, they were smarter about it than we gave them credit for. And they were setting up their own boundaries. So when you say you put everything on the internet, for who and where? And what exactly do you mean when you say everything? Because people put their business out in the street all the time, <laughs> everything. And that's, but there's a limited sphere that can hear that. So think Yeah, but it used to be, it used to be within your neighborhood. Yeah. You know, oh, well, something happened, whatever, whatever happened. So maybe the people, your neighbors knew, or maybe, you know, the people two blocks away knew, or your, now the entire world, the entire world will know. They can possibly know. Yeah. So they, it's there for the whole world Because they generally see, don't say. care. Yeah. No one cares about you. No one cares. Wait, wait, wait. wait in wait, general. Whoa, 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 whoa. Uh, in uh, general. Uh, no one cares until you mess up. Well, and even, yeah. No one and cares about you unless you put something out there that draws attention. So I don't, I don't no, necessarily and, agree with I, that. I just, I think we all, there's, there's a, we're, we're walking this balance, and I'm trying to walk in and, and trying to answer your question. I think we all love ourselves, and the internet allows us to love ourselves more. We assume people care far more than they do. This is what I did. No one cares, right? You do it because a few people care and they're listening. No one cares what's on television except the five programs you happen to watch, right? There's a lot of stuff out there that you're never gonna see, never gonna hear about. That's the same with our lives. So we have a risk, we have a higher risk now because maybe it's ink, maybe it stays there forever, maybe you look for a job. Years from now and someone does a search and you had no idea it was popular in this little weird community and it pops up. So there's, there's an extra thing to think about. I'm not trying to dismiss the risk. But I also think it's worth balancing that out, the ego side of that, that assumes that everybody's just trying to wait for a moment to be a peeping Tom around your life. Where's the young lady? Where'd she go? What's your name again? Rebecca. Rebecca. I think, I think the, um, what I talk to about with my managers at work and what I think about when I'm putting things on the internet or in an interview or whatever, if I don't want it read back to me, if it's something I wouldn't want to see read back to me in the New York Times or something, or I wouldn't say on CNN, then don't put it out there. So if it's not something that you would like to read about yourself in a newspaper or see on the local news, then I wouldn't say it. I think that's pretty good advice. 
Okay, uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Lance Dixon. I'm a senior English major here at Morehouse College, originally from Miami, Florida. And uh, my question, I guess it kind of lends itself towards what Maggie was speaking about, but I'm wondering about psychological attachment as it relates to social networking, because I know people who will go to like events on campus or off campus or, or what, what have you, and will start to get depressed or upset as their battery just starts to die because they can't because they can't tweet about where they at where they're at or what they're doing Real. or what's the latest thing happening on stage at this event or you know so forth. And also, I know people who have said that, oh, I'm you know I'm deleting my Facebook, I'm leaving my Twitter, I'm going on a purge. I don't want to you know involve myself in any of that anymore. And then two weeks later, they built up the same stable of friends or followers that they had. So I, I kind of just wonder, like, what, what you think, or I guess what the whole panel thinks about that psychological attachment, and as, it, as social networking starts to sort of dictate our lives more, how, how do we make that separation, or why can't people make that separation? I mean, I'm not, I'm not separated. I mean, I am, I'm psychologically attached to my online communities because it's a big part of my life. And so, like, for me, it adds value to my life, and so... I try to make sure my battery never dies. Like I have extra, like in my bag, I have multiple extra battery packs to make sure that I'm always connected. And so to me, it adds value. So when I go to a movie, I can tweet and say, have you seen this and what did you think? And so instead of like, it used to be, I wanted to know what Ebert thought and I still love what Ebert thinks about it. But now I get to see even what people I'm connected to think about it. And so, I mean, th that psychological attachment could be unhealthy in, in some ways for certain people, but I mean, I'm very much attached to it because it's a big part of my life. I just don't see a problem with it, though. I see a You've problem. You've got to get an extended battery. <laughs> this, is a, this is a phone, this is an extended life battery. And then you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> I've, I have, uh, I'm in your shoes to a point, but then yeah. I have had some self-awareness moments of like, I'm not sure I'm happy with who I'm being right now. And it, it's around Foursquare, the, the service that lets you check in where you are. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, I take my check-ins very seriously. I try to craft them, try to have a nice little message. I want, do I send it to Twitter? Do I send it to Facebook? Do I use somebody else's name? I have to get their permission. Yeah. And I could be, there could be a robbery going on. I wouldn't know. Because yeah. I'm busy checking <laughs> in. Unless it's left as a tip in Foursquare that you're about to get robbed, <laughs> I would just be empty of funds. You yeah. know? And they'd be like, but I checked in. And there is, there is, a, there is a loss to my mind of... And it comes back to that physicality, that locality, that geography. I like presence. Yeah. I, I appreciate it. And when sometimes the best gifts I've had is being disconnected unintentionally. And I look at this, I daydream. Mm -hmm. I reflect. Mm -hmm. I go ride my bike or swim. Or do, I relish the moments of isolation from the digital, from the Borg, yeah. from the mesh, from the matrix. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and, that I, and we were talking about just uh, checking in. Yeah. Usually, you know, my partner said, I, he freaks out when I check in in yeah. restaurants, and I don't do it. I do it when we leave. Right. Because like, people, and CNN. Because people are weird. CNN was like, uh, you, you're worried about your safety. I don't do it until I leave. Check in yeah, <laughs> check in when I leave. Maybe like for me, like, for, so for me, when I'm out on a date with my wife, there's a no tech policy. Mm. Um, if I'm at the dinner table with the kids, don't bring the phone to the table. I mean, there, <laughs> there, you do have to have boundaries. You know, if I'm tucking my kids in, uh, you, I used to like take my, you know, because now you don't have flashlight. Now you use your phone as a flashlight. Yeah. And so like I used to, like, so my, I would read my son a book in bed and I would use the flashlight and then I would find myself psychologically attached wanting to tweet or read my <laughs> tweets as I was reading the book. And so it was like, okay, don't even take it to the bed as I read the book, yeah. you know? And so there is an attachment there, but you have to still have boundaries. Maggie? Yeah. yeah. Always been able to read. I mean, I read Good Night Moon 350 times, so I can actually daydream, think of a story or something like that while I read Good Night Moon. Yeah. There's another level of control there. <laughs> but I think what's really important when you say psychological attachment or when you talk about privacy and putting it all online is to think about somewhere about, you know, when we talk about geography too, the inner geography. You know, the, 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 these things are externalities. They are, you know, it's kind of like women who only dress for men, maybe. In some ways, we might tiptoe into the territory of just being there only for the other. I went to the University of Maryland and I was doing lots of interviews. They've been doing some of the most amazing research on sort of digital detoxes, where they have kids mandatorily you know, signing off for 24 hours. 
And it was really interesting. Some were relieved. Some were really, you know, scratching their heads. What do they do? <laughs> they were contorting themselves about what to do with this 24-hour period. And, and then uh, the, the predominant sensation that I got from interviewing dozens of these kids was fear. Mm. Now, this was an extreme digital detox because they couldn't even turn on the radio, so they had to drive places in silence. But there was a kid in class, for instance, who said, I never realized how much I talked to him to myself. And the journalism professor said, what do you mean, talk to yourself? I'm like, I do that, people in New York do that. But anyhow, he said, I mean, in my mind, I never actually realized. He w hadn't, he'd been so snowed by the noise, yeah. he drowned his inner voice out. But that's where the growth. Wait, and, wait, wait, and, wait, wait, wait. I think what you said is very important. Say that again. He had been so snow, you know, we live in such a noisy, cluttered, interrupt-driven world that in some ways we drown out those deeper, you know, confusing, Creative. difficult inner voices that we have. That's where the, the depth of humanity has always come from. And Jared Lanier, who's this wonderful creator of virtual reality, has this great book called You Are Not a Gadget. It's a really good book. Yes. And in it, one of the greatest lines is, in order to share, you have to be somebody. Mm. In order to come to the table, you have to be, you have to know what you think first. And I think that's really important, especially with kids or with all of us. So that's, I think, where the tipping point comes from me. I think that, it, it, was your question answered? question, yeah. I think that Steve Jobs said, uh, in, and I think it was his address to Stanford, like, don't let your inner voice be crowded out by he the did. criticism of, of someone else. He did. So, and I think that's sort of what follow you were, or you were saying, yourself. follow your dreams, yeah. 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 So listen, we're getting close to wrapping up. I'm sorry we didn't get to everyone. If you guys, if you have a very quick, I mean quick 10 second question, I'll let you jump in real quick and then we're gonna have to wrap it up. You first. Sure, absolutely. My name's Grayson. Uh, I'm the uh, web producer from Morning Express with Rob and Mead over on CNN's sister channel, HLN. Um, and I have a question for the, uh, the, the panel, especially Pete and, and you, Don. You guys, Pete, you have 2 million followers. Don, you have 100,000 followers. How do you choose who to respond to, and why do you choose to respond to those people? 120,000. 35,000. <laughs> Go ahead, Pete. Uh, I don't know. I think that, that uh, it's interesting because it, I think it speaks to the last question a little bit. Is a lot of the time people are like, can you just retweet me or can you follow me? And it, it's weird how the internet has made everyone feel so self-important, I feel like. And uh, it, I'm, I kind of start to wonder like what the, hum, what the human experience is. Because when I'm places, I see people like video, like shooting video of bands or, you know, like, like can we take that picture again because it didn't look good in it? And it's like, that didn't used to exist even when I was little. You know, like it's like you would go see the band because you wanted to see the music, not so you could tweet about it. And like, you couldn't take another picture. Um, or you could, but you probably took another bad one. But um, <laughs> I think that uh, sometimes you can have a, an actual converse, a great conversation with somebody, someone who's just having a bad day, or, or maybe, you know, I mean, I, I think that, that sarcasm's not really taught on the internet, so someone was like, oh man, like, the old Pete Wentz used to be so much funnier than the new Pete Wentz, and I'm like, all right, I'll do this, yeah. and I was like, that's because this is just a spam bot, and Pete's just swimming in a pool of money, and then the person was like, really? And I'm like, no, Pete Wentz is dead, he's like, oh, we left him on an island somewhere, you know, and they were like, really? And I'm like, it, it just... <laughs> okay. This is how I spend my time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so it depends on, it, you can sort of feel who to respond to and who not to. I never get involved with controversy, first of all, and things that are political, I don't get involved with that because that's not, as a journalist, I can't. But I think if it's clever um, or if it warrants a response, like if someone accuses me of something or my company, if, if there's a way that I can respond to it without you know, being accusatory of something, I can, but, um, I, and you can't interact with everybody, so you have to pick and choose, and I think I, I pick and choose the people who are fun, and who are actually authentic, rather than who are just sort of boring. Yeah. Thank you. R quickly, and then we're going to, thank you. Hi, my name is Ross Knight, and um, social media helped me to become an international photographer within two years of leaving corporate America. So my question for the panel is, what role do you feel that social media plays on consumer behavior when it comes to purchasing different products and services, especially since some of social media or some of the sites restricted corporations from being part of the community starting off? So we have to do a quick answer. Yeah, um, in the beginning. <laughs> in the beginning. <laughs> Listen, there was, 
fire. <laughs> we, are, we are all, if you're a musician, if you're a pastor, if you are an author, uh, if you're whatever I am and, and, and whatever Don is, you're competing for you know. people's attention, ultimately. Uh, you think you, uh, one TV show is fighting another TV show. You're fighting a YouTube cat video. You're fighting a video game. You're fighting a child like, that's hungry, and you should probably feed it. So what corporations have an opportunity to do, hopefully not abusively and evilly, is be natural. You know, you've had this big sledgehammer, like TV advertising, billboards, outdoor, digital. Quick and it's answer. horrible. It's horrible. <laughs> Web, it's horrible. You talk down to people. You, know, you, you tell people what you think they want, and they know who, who they are, and so you can listen. Yeah. You have an opportunity to listen, and I think beyond selling stuff, or beyond selling goods, but selling ideas, selling movement, selling possibility, listening is, is the great tool that we have. We can put a microphone around the world and figure mm. out what's going on, and what do we do with that? First, you have to actually shut up a little bit, so that's my generic, broad-minded advice about corporations, hopefully for beyond corporations. Okay, so listen, we're at the end, but I want to just real quickly go around to each person, and uh, seriously, 10 seconds or I'm going to cut you off. So what, tell whatever you want to say, whether it's advice about social media, what you love about social media, or some solution to offer the people who are here paying attention. Sure, I, I think we are just scratching the surface of our potential to change the world through social media, and most of us tend to count ourselves out and think that we couldn't play a role in changing the world through social media, but I've seen just the regular average person around the world make a huge difference. And so I would encourage you to use your time to figure out ways that you could really impact and change lives through social media. Uh, I'd say that don't use the internet and social media as an alternative to living a, a life as a human being, but uh, use it as a tool to kind of expand. And that's one of the best ways you could look at it, I think. I, we were at one of the greatest shifts of power in the history of the world with potential for individuals, as Sean spoke so eloquently too. I would also advise us to remember usage versus creation and who is making these tools and what are their values and what are their assumptions that they put in. We blindly accept these terms of service, both explicit and implicit, in the design of these tools and the rules that are set up by a certain type of person. Are you that type of person? Are, does the user look like you? Do they think like you? Do they care about the things you care about that builder? Should you become that builder? You have that opportunity to go the next step. Um, I'd like to reiterate that these are very new tools. We don't know where they're going. We're kind of along for the ride. But for millions of years, human beings have you know, created, loved, produced, and been together in biological ways. And let's not forget that, because that really does make us happy. And give the gift of attention to people, really face to face, don't turn away. Give the gift of attention. Very good. For me, I think I've worked in media for a long time and I think media in general, I'm not talking about my company specifically, but likes to control the message. And social media, places like Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, they allow you to listen to the audience and not shape a message and they will tell you what they like. And if you build a bridge, they will come. So thank you guys. I really appreciate you all coming. CNN is, we're incredibly grateful for you, to you for coming. And make sure you not only tune into us digitally, digitally on CNN.com, but watch us on television as well. <laughs> we're usually in the 34 area, 834, somewhere up in there, 835 if you watch HLN. But thank you so much. We appreciate your support and we thank you for coming out. The panel, everyone, thank you. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.